He said, there will come a point in your life and you should have this realization, which I did, that you will at some point fall out of love with your business. You won't hate it, you just won't have that enjoyment. So it's not so much love, don't have that attachment. Learn that you have to detach from it. Hello folks, welcome to My First Business. I'm Naeem Pervez and this podcast is for entrepreneurs, young or old, who are looking to improve the way that they look after their business. Each episode is designed to be like a conversation with a mentor that you never had and you'll find inspiration, guiding principles and possibly some solutions to your current business problems. We talk about the lows like wanting to shut it all down and we talk about the highs like starting your second or your third or your fourth successful business and also everything in between. My guest in today's episode is Rishi Kohli. Now Rishi is a serial entrepreneur who's founded four diversified businesses focused on sustainable and renewable energy and he's done it across the Middle East and in Africa as well. His latest business is Fika Mobility. Rishi is building a new generation of electric vehicles. In fact, he's just changing the game completely. His new battery and swapping technology drastically reduces the time and the cost it takes to get these vehicles back on the road. These electric vehicles are the first of their kind. They're already on the road in Kenya and they're creating a path towards cleaner mobility in Africa. I really love this conversation with Rishi, especially because of how deep we were able to go into the human side of entrepreneurship. Here are some of the highlights of the things we talked about. Rishi and I talked about how to balance speed and perfectionism. And we talked about the difference between being careful and right versus moving fast and breaking things. We talked about his approach to risk taking and what he learned from his father about betting small and betting on himself. We talked about the greed that plagues entrepreneurs and how many entrepreneurs don't actually realize that the pie is big enough for everyone. We talked about the ability to retain employees and his father's magic on keeping three generations of people within the same business. We talked about family businesses in general, about how his mom is the best salesperson he's ever seen, how his father's been a guiding light throughout, how he works with his brother, and also how he gets inspirations from his aunts and uncles. I learned about how he iterates on his electric vehicles. Man, this guy just rolls up his sleeves and he just knows the right way to serve his right customers. Now, my dear audience, there's one main reason you should listen to this episode and solely because of Rishi's storytelling. He was so humble throughout the conversation, I couldn't tell that I was sitting with the boss of all bosses. His warmth is something that will surely light up your day. So without much further ado, please enjoy the wisdom of Rishi Kohli on the EO series of the My First Business podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Entrepreneurs Organization. Now, before I tell you what they do, first, let me tell you the numbers behind Entrepreneurs Organization, or EO for short. So they started in 1987. They've currently got 17,000 influential business owners as their members, spread across 213 chapters in 60 plus countries worldwide. They've been in the UAE since 1997 and have 119 members here with a median member sales of roughly $4 million. And altogether, the total number of people employed by their members is over 23,000. And they've got members from all sorts of industries, including technology, healthcare, oil and gas, real estate, hospitality, jewelry, communications, logistics, travel, I could really go on. Mind blown yet? Now, here's what EO is actually all about. Here's what you get for being a member of EO, or here's what they do for you. EO in UAE provides an effective platform for networking, education, and support for business owners. The entrepreneurial journey can be lonely, and I can attest to that. And with an economy that changes on a dime, it can be hard to know what your next move should be. And that's where EO comes in with their support. One of the key benefits of membership is access to a robust calendar of events, including workshops, social events, and learning opportunities. So you get a ton of networking opportunities, as well as a chance to learn from experts in your own field. EO also offers a mentorship program, so they pair you up with experienced business leaders who can offer guidance and support as you grow your own business. So for me, I've personally or vicariously benefited a lot from being in the EO network through their accelerator program, of which my partner is a part of. And if you are a business owner tired of taking on your challenges all alone and are looking for unique networking opportunities, along with structured support through accountability groups and mentors, 
well, you can either start a podcast like I did, or if you don't want to do that, I highly encourage you to apply to EO. I'll leave a link for you in the show notes. And if you're not fully convinced yet, I'll be bringing on business owners on this podcast that are currently members of EO, including today's guest, so you can get a sneak peek of what you're getting. Rishi, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Naeem. Um, I don't want to get too emotional, but maybe you will. I do want to start somewhere where I think uh, it's quite formative for you, where I've been told by a little birdie. Yeah, I wonder uh, who this birdie is. I'm not going to reveal my sources, but sure. the little birdie knows who they are. <laughs> okay. um, your father yeah. was the first in your genera- line of generation to be entrepreneurial. Is that, is that fair to say, or was there... Was it happening before him as well? Um, I would say from an impact point of view, the person I remember was him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know his grandfather was an entrepreneur. Okay, so your great-grandfather. Yeah, so he moved to Kenya, um, mm-hmm. I would say late sort of 1880s, 18, 18, whatever, 90s. Um, from Lahore, which was then undivided India, mm-hmm. and uh, then came to Kenya, and he set up, uh, like I guess, he's probably one of the first Indians to do it globally, the corner shop, but in the middle of some forest, yeah. and he was supplying whatever, um, cigarettes, bread, bread, yeah. and uh, and ended up with a huge area of land and of, of, of like a big tree estate sort of thing. Wait, wasn't he there to set up like a railway? So I think... That was probably the plan, but that came much later for mm. a lot of the Indians who came. But he was, from my understanding of the recollections, because he came a lot earlier, he was the guy who turned up on Dows. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there was a whole bunch of other family who also turned up to build a railway from um, what was Mombasa um, all the way up to um, um, the other side of Kenya, which is the eastern mm-hmm. side and into Uganda. And I'm not sure how far, or the Great East African Rail- Railway, as it was called. Yeah. Yeah. But the real impact was of who I would remember would be my father. Yes. Like it starts there. And the reason that I ask is, so I don't come from a line of, of businessmen or businesswomen. Yeah. Um, and not to my parents' fault. Like they did what they had to do. And, you know, I do admire anyone who's non entrepreneur as well, that they play a very important role in society. But growing up uh, for Alina and myself, um, my wife and business partner, we didn't have um, we didn't have that kind of uh, someone to look up to. So all I've been doing is looking for role models. And what I've also learned in my journey of Dubai business people, for example, there's a lot of family business people. And I have fallen in love with generational businesses uh, because for something to be so to stand the test of time through multiple generations and no matter what comes in a way, it gets stronger. So the anti-fragility of them as well, some of the ones that I'm seeing here is, um, is so inspirational. And I feel like those lessons are not captured in your typical business books or your, or your MBA courses. There's something special about, uh, you know, the, the lesson and the wisdom. So I want to tease some of that, some of that out. Sure. Um, you do also have some uncles that you look up to. In this in this line, or yeah, or was the little birdie wrong about there, that? <laughs> there are a couple of uncles who yeah. who've been very successful entrepreneurs. Yeah, um, uh, namely my mum's brother. Mm-hmm. Um, he ran a very successful um, uh, nursery school. Both him and his wife, who were my auntie, yeah. they ran a very successful nursery school. Their story was actually very phenomenal. They she was a teacher, special needs teacher. They, he was a uh, financial controller, stroke manager, uh, became managing director of one of the most exclusive Jaguar, Daimler, Rolls Royce dealerships in in London in the sort of late eighties, early nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, he then went on to set up a um, nursery school with his wife, and they set it up. I'm not sure you know, didn't like porter cabins you find on construction sites, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Yeah. for the construction sort of engineers' office and all yeah. that sort of stuff. They set yeah. it up with I think it was three or four it's a good business, and then it went on to twelve. And then I remember him buying a huge old listed priory building, yeah, uh, on like three four acres of land. Totally renovated the inside, and it became a nursery school of I think 250 or 300 kids, yeah. 50 staff. Uh, and then he eventually exited it as well. Um, but he's very entrepreneurial. He then said he's going to take a break. He put his hands into different things, I, I, which I'm not going to talk about because it's not my story. 
And yeah. he then moved to another end of the, the country in the UK. Yeah. Um, he's just set up another nursery school, um, and which my cousins are now running with him. Yeah. And now they're setting up a second one. Um, and I think that entrepreneurial bug is in him and it's, it probably flows from both sides. Yeah. Aside from my father, um, I think a real true entrepreneur is my mother, hmm. actually. Okay. Um, she, uh, extremely creative, talented woman. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, I remember had this, you know, passion of just entertaining really well at home mm -hmm. when we grew up in Kenya. So people will come home, should have amazing fruit displays, aside from the amazing food and whatever she was doing, amazing fruit displays and amazing flower displays, which she would create herself. And very often friends and family would say, we're having a dinner party at home. Could you do some flowers for us? So mum will do, she'll say, okay, what's your color theme? And they'll be like, oh, you know, like, I don't know, red and white or whatever it is, pink and white or whatever it is. And she would do some flowers for them and just take it there as a gift. Yeah. And then it became, she got pushed through, I would say family and friends again, to say, why don't you take this seriously? And one of her closest friends, uh, they were building a building and her friend ran a an Indian high-end women's wear boutique who okay. she was very close to. And they said, we've got this corner at the end of the boutique, which we're not going to use. And it's like 800,000 square foot. Why don't you put up a shop there? And mum was also known for having great homewares at home. So she went off to London, and I still remember this, I think it was sort of mid 90s. And she was away from us for about two to three weeks, actually a month. She went to a um, florist, which is by royal appointment, uh, at that time, Her Majesty the Queen, mm -hmm. um, called Moises Stevens. And she used to go and train there in the Mayfair and Harrods um, branches. Um, on a floristry course to upskill. Yeah. And she qualified with very high ratings for that. She then came back, opened the shop, but she also took on major distribution brands for high-end homeware stuff. So you could talk about your cut glass, your uh, so your Riddle crystal brands, your Port Marion's, your high-end um, crockery and mm -hmm. beautiful ornaments that go in your house. And she set up a shop. And I, I remember around sort of Diwali, Christmas, big sort of you know, calendar events in the year, these containers used to arrive from either the UK, India, Europe, and our, our front yard, which is we had a huge front yard in Kenya, um, would be repackaged. Just boxes. Just boxes and boxes. Yeah. And I remember her just sitting there under the shade with all this, obviously in those days, there's no major inventory yeah. on computers, right? So it's all like manually recorded. Oh, this yeah. broke, this goes there and whatever. And we'd get involved. Mm -hmm. And then she went off and um, would then do an exhibition either in the shop or hire out an exhibition corner in a, you know, in a, in a, in a hotel, do like, you know, cocktails or whatever it is, yeah. uh, high tea for the women. And she would then sell to these high end, um, customers or just customers as, as a whole. Yeah. And, and literally within two, three days of those exhibitions or a week of that stuff arriving, everything was gone. Um, and, um, then we moved to the UK and then she yeah. was, you know, my brother and I were there and my mother and father were back and forth. That was a big life changer, but we can come out to why yeah. that was a life changer for me then. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, she then wanted, she was spending a bit more time in the UK and then she said, I want to open a business here. And I actually found a florist shop for sale and I negotiated a sale of this shop and then we bought the shop. And she ran it, but this was a totally different piece. It was a pure florist shop, yeah. you know, freezing cold. You're dealing with flowers. You're dealing with um, umpteen amount of deliveries. We ran it for, I think, three, four years. I remember Valentine's days, you used to do like 500 deliveries and they had to be in by five o'clock because yeah. everyone's going home or earlier because everyone's going to yeah. do their hair and get ready and whatever. Yeah. And I was in, I used to take day off for that. Uh, and the pressure you'd have with that. Just but it was great fun, Mother's Day, Christmas, yeah. all those sort of stuff. But yeah, mum mum also yeah. had a great mum, I believe, in the between my mother and father. Yeah. Um is probably the more sales, I would say they're both go getters. Yeah. Very driven, very hardworking. Um, but mum is more the salesperson. She right. is very much, yeah, I know how to sell. Like even yeah. now when I talk to her about my new business, which is um the electric 
mobility business in Kenya, mm-hmm. which is Fika, she'll say, yeah. uh, and I'll come back and so, say, how many bikes did you sell? And who's buying them? And I'm like, well, you know, it's, not, it's a new technology. It's not that easy. And we're, we're yeah. getting there. We've sold two more. We've sold five more. And <laughs> yeah. this and, you know. Um, yeah. And I remember during COVID when I had a pivot from my car wash, waterless car washing business to disinfection and sanitization, yeah. um, the, the office just couldn't cope with the incoming minor calls. Yeah. And she said, um, I'll come. I'll handle it. And she actually it. came in for two days yeah. or three days. <laughs> I love it. And actually the sales came in a lot higher because she's just like, we do this and we do that. And she's also That's the OCD. person you need on the phone, right? Yeah, she's also OCD because <laughs> she could sell the whole, you need to do this, you know, mm-hmm. and this and that. And yeah. she's very entrepreneurial. I, I love the sound of that because uh, I think, you know, as you're telling the story, I was kind of relating, yet not. If my mom, I feel like if my mom had the opportunity, their st- our stories would match a lot. Um, it's just that, you know, she took the role of being a, ha- a homemaker more seriously. And, you know, that was kind of, you know, the, the life that was set out for her. Mm. But in the back of her, like um, the hustle, I can still see it today in just the way she runs a home. If she were given the chance, my dad says now, now that he's 71, he tells me, he's like, your mom could be the prime minister of Pakistan if, you know, if, if I had let her work. She, that's he says, if I had let her work, she would have been in office right now running the country. Yeah, that's, um, and that's amazing coming from your father as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. And he realizes that too, right? Like... Um, it was, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a cultural thing too, right? Like that she had to fight a bit, but you know what? Um, that's why you have kids so that they can, you know, live on, live on to the dream. So I want to, I want to see how much from your parents, from your mom and your dad. And I, I feel like I'll get different answers knowing now that they're two different personalities. Let's talk about risk taking. Um, who did you pick up your heuristics and thinking about risk taking, risk mitigation, uh, we were chatting a bit before we started recording, and uh, you seem to be a bit more calculated, uh, if I'm right. I'm just wondering, where did that develop from? Which side did that develop What, more? the calculating side? Yeah, the being more calculated. Um, yeah. I think it's a bit of both. Whilst mom is very much a bit more of the go-getter and the salesperson, she mm-hmm. would take risks. But I think earlier on, dad was very much a risk taker mm-hmm. and would do it, I guess, being, he was younger then and would do it. Yeah. But obviously the last few years of when I remember, I mean, he passed away nearly just over nine years ago, so but for yeah. the, the last probably five, six years of the decade before was quite tough for him in business, mm. but he never stopped, you know, he'd never let that come across. But what, what I'm trying to say is with him, I think prior to that decade before he passed away, he was very much a risk taker as well. Yeah. But when it came to risk in business, but not risk in investments, if that makes sense. It's two What's different. The difference? I think, so if he had money and he wanted to invest it, he would be more conservative about doing the investments, mm-hmm. like something that guarantees him a return. And But he was also a little bit more trustworthy with certain people about giving that right. investment or where to look after his money. Did it work all the time? No, but that's also not their fault, but some of it could have been. But yeah. it's not... You don't blame people. You took the risk yourself, right? Yeah. Um, but he likes to bet on himself more. He did. and yeah. But he would give, when when it came to the business side, he would, he, he would, he would look for the opportunity a lot quicker. Like if something was not. What would be an example? So. I remember a story. I, I remember. So this is probably where my sort of taste of entrepreneurship came up or getting mm-hmm. involved in a business came up. Mm-hmm. I think I was about 17 and it was like what we call our well, co- equivalent, the summer break, sort of July, June, July. Mm-hmm. And my father, his business is, it's nothing exciting, but um, I owe everything or my brother and I and the family owe everything to that business because it fed us, clothed us, educated us and put us where we are. And he gave us everything from there. And including what mom's business came much, much later on. His business is spare parts in a very small, obscure town. They call it a city now, but it's very small um, in Western Kenya, mm-hmm. um, Koki Sumu, it's by Lake Victoria. And he basically does specialized parts for reconditioning brakes and clutches for transport and other spare parts. And he went into that specialism and he grew. And that's the town he was born in. And um, and obviously my grandfather was back in the day the mayor and the 
MP and the freedom fighter from there and everything. So that mm -hmm. was his home. Mm -hmm. um, I remember dad then, obviously you not just do business there, you do it right across the country. And I remember around early 90s, he started to venture into going to like the main port in Mombasa because there's a lot of opportunity, right? And he would be supplying materials that link to the transport industry from so whether it be brakes or clutches. And then there'd be more specialized parts that needed to be done, but that wouldn't stop him. I remember going with him once to the port and I think it was around early July. I was there, I was just walking around. I was, I was like literally like a, I don't know, carrying the files, like yeah. literally there were files in those days, no computers yeah. and laptops for us. And he's carrying these five files and it's super hot and humid and you're walking around and he'd be like, take this file to this guy, go and pick up this tender from there. And I'm like a runner, Yeah. but it educates you, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, he'll give you a certain file, ask him the file for these computer boards that they need on the cranes. Hmm. And I'm looking at him going, we don't do that. And he's like, can you just go and pick it up? So I went, picked it up, gave it to him. And then the phone call goes to somebody in London or my, my uncle, who, who's the uncle I spoke about. He says, can you help us look for these? He said, yeah, 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 I know, we'll, we'll check. And he's obviously checking Square or finding, you know, yellow pages and yeah. And, and whatever it was in different ways of finding ringing stuff people out, off, ringing yeah. people. And there's yeah. a way of finding it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and the directories worked. And he, he sniffed an opportunity out of that. And he sold these special computer circuit boards that went on huge, you know, the big cranes you see mm -hmm. in, in ports here mm -hmm. and globally. Yeah. They are the sort of control cranes, main controller where in those yeah. days they would sit, the guy would sit up there and control, yeah. and they still do. Yeah. And it would be the main control board for it. And he sold like 50 of them. <laughs> and I'm like, Dan, how do you do this? He said, Look, I got the product, supplied it, and then he takes the agency on for it. And that's yeah. how he was. He would sniff something and say, Yeah, let me let me build on this. And have you have you picked that up as well for yourself? Would you um, say? Yes, but I've also learned in more recent times to focus. Because I also saw some mistakes in that with him. Not with him generally, but you see it yourself. With the model as a itself, yeah. Yeah. Sorry? With the model itself of yeah, doing I think that, yeah. in those days it was very much he sniffed an opportunity, his feet were on the ground, he was in there, he could supply the product, distribution agencies were quicker to come by. Um and I think also the world in terms of how you would do business was more trusting. Mm. Like you could literally say to these guys, we're buying it didn't come 50 boards as one, it was like, we'll do 20 of these circuit board, computer boards yeah. now, but there's a potential of 50 and then 10 came, 20 came, and then he would send a fax because that's what it was. Yeah. And the fax would go through and he would be like, could we now look into a more formal uh, agreement or an agency? And the next thing comes through is an agency agreement, right? Yeah. Or an appointment letter. Whereas now it's all about, you know, how is your distribution channel? What's mm -hmm. your go-to-market plan and all that? Yeah. Whereas in those days, I think that relationship and trust was a lot more different. Now it's tenders after tenders. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. we were tendering then, right? Yeah. But because we had the confidence on the ground to achieve it. Yeah. But I think he was very good at picking up opportunities. He was very much a relationship person. Yeah. And that's the one thing I pick up from him. And I think so does my brother. And I talk about him because mm -hmm. we work together in certain businesses that we have. We've got some family collaboration there and in, in mm -hmm. stuff we've grown, which we'll come to. Yeah. But he, his base, basic thing is relationship, relationship. If you can bring relationship. And his biggest motto, mm -hmm. what I will always remember him for, was uh, you could club them together is integrity, honesty. But if you can, if you're honest and, you know, integrity is paramount to you, mm -hmm. you will succeed. And if you build that relationship and trust with people, you will only grow and enhance, yeah. you know? Um, and I think that was the big takeaway I have with how he would, I mean, he, I grew up in my early years, very, very sort of formative years. Yeah. My father having this business in Kisumu, we living in Nairobi, somebody running the day-to-day -day operations of the, of the, you could say the warehouse, the shop front, whatever, uh, the workshop and all that. But I remember my father literally leaving every Monday morning and hitting the road and crisscrossing by car, not by flight, Kenya, and yeah. coming back on Friday night. I, I, there's some horrific stories. You know, he'd go into these farmlands to meet transporters because he has to, you know, supply clutches and brakes worth 
50 to 100 con- um, tractors and their transport yeah. uh, for, for wheat and you know, sugar factories. And I remember yeah. once there was no mobile phones. So he yeah. would go there and then he would radio call from the camp uh, to the camp to the farm guy and say, please call my wife and say I've reached safely and I'm here for the night. Yeah. And this particular night, there was no phone call. Oh. And I still remember this, me and my mother sitting there. My brother was very young then going, where is dad, where is dad? And then finally this guy called back to say, look, he's in the game park. This is the Masai Mara game park. They were crossing, his car got stuck. He helped another, he got out, he helped another car that got stuck. In that process, they both got stuck 100 meters down the road in a a marsh. Um, And they, the rangers have identified that there he's now him and his his colleague are in this van with other tourists but they're surrounded by lions and but the rangers are there so we had that comfort but you're still kind of thinking (laughs) hang on dad's so i mum didn't say this to me and the guy didn't say the 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 sort of farm owner didn't say it in detail that he said they're stuck there okay we only knew about the lions thing more in detail when he came back two days later but here's this if it was me and I'd got out the next morning, which I did it, he did it at five, six in the morning, went to the camp, had a shower, I would have gone to sleep, relaxed, yeah. sat by the pool and got a bit of R&R, got recharged my batteries. No, what did he do? He had a shower, he got up, had breakfast and and, and hit the road to, to go and make money again. That was him. That was his spirit. That's amazing. Very hear. hardworking, very yeah. sort of... You mentioned in there you, you took relationships pretty seriously. So I want to talk about uh, not just suppliers and customers, but even building a team, um, like especially in his businesses, I don't think they were solo businesses, right? And he had to build a team around that. What have you picked up and what have you put into practice or maybe even what do you challenge in terms of how he worked with his operators of his business or his second in commands or just generally anyone in the business? So a lot of people thought he was very much one man show, which he kind of showed that to the world. But if you look at the back operations of this workshop and everything, at the highest point, he only employed 15, 20 people. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he always, because of the relationship in that town, he would employ people he trusted, right? In terms of second in command, third in command, and so on and so forth. And he had immense trust in all of them. But when you look at the wider team who were the, operators on machines and you know working around the workshop and all that he built immense trust but he also made sure that he would employ within their family group so the local kenyan indigenous whoever they were working the family Mm -hmm. the business is now 40 plus years old we have my father employed a gentleman his son is there (laughs) his grandson is there Mm-hmm. So there are three generations working in that business till today. The person working there has known me since I was two years old, right? So for him, my father was also like a father. The person who runs the business today, like day-to-day operations, has been with the family 36 mm-hmm. years. So how, how do you replicate that in these, in these um, okay, I don't want to be, maybe in these times or even in Dubai, like what is it about you know, the founder or the owner of the business to not be able to attract one person for life, but their kids and probably their grandkids. I think people today are impatient. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if you look at Dubai or you look at more modern metropolis style cities like Dubai, it's harder to keep people retained, right? Or, um, and very few are like that. We have someone in our group office in Leme, Lemmy Group's mm-hmm. wider office. He's been with us 12 years in my car washing company. I've got someone 11 years now. Um, we would have had 13, but he had to go back post COVID because he did get COVID. He was intubated for eight weeks. He you nearly know, passed away, but he wants to come back, but his health is still not 100%. So if you effectively think about it, we build very special relationships with people. And they, we, we, we instill that belief that Yes, you work in the company, but this is your family. Mm-hmm. And we take care of one each other. When my father passed away, these three, four people, maybe even wider, I was in with him when he passed away. 
and my my mother and brother were here my wife were here but they were the big support network that morning making sure tickets were booked making sure you know everything was sorted out who's going to look after the business i mean immediate like we don't know how long we're away for two weeks three weeks four yeah. weeks that that everything just kicked in and i think for and that was still very early on. Like I'm saying somebody's been with us 12 years and this he passed away nine years ago. So he's only been in the company three years. Yeah. But this particular one or two individuals have seen us go through our pains and our struggles. Yeah. So and they've they've been with us, you could say as right hand men or women. Yeah. And they almost as a part of your family then, right? That that's the yeah. difference. That's the difference here. You know, they're part of your family. You know, they 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 come to you know, some of them have even flown out to, we've flown them out, but they've also flown out to my yeah. brother's wedding. Yeah. You know, that's how close we see them. They are family to us. Yeah. And and that's the relationship. And is, is, that, is that a pipe dream for a lot of people? Because, you know, stories like these are getting rarer and rarer and rarer um, to be able to keep people that long. Like what is, what can a business owner do to encourage that, knowing that people are a lot pickier, they're a lot more impatient now. And um, a p part of it is the honesty and integrity and things that just come naturally to you in terms of relationship building. But is there is there a missing um, factor that more business owners can have so that they can develop these kind of relationships long term with people? I think empathy is one. Hmm. Right. Empathy is one. Uh, it, you, you need to be empathetic. And, and show vulnerability as well as a business owner, as a founder, co-founder, whatever you're, CEO, man, it doesn't matter. The title is mm -hmm. irrelevant. Yeah. You you need to also be show vulnerability to your team that yeah you've made you you can make mistakes and 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 how you own up to them. Yeah. And and I don't mean this in a Dubai, UAE, Middle Eastern, or a South Asian way because that's predominantly where the employment base comes out of. Mm -hmm. I think this very sort of yes sir, subservient, mm. obedient thing of, oh, if I make a mistake, I'll lose my job. Yeah. That culture needs to go away here. And I think we have come a long way here in the 16 years or 15, nearly 16 years I've been here. I think that's yeah. going away. Yeah. But I still see, you know, when you employ somebody who's only been here six months, you can see, oh God, this, this is that cycle is going to repeat that they, they're going to be scared to own up to a mistake or even tell you the mistake until it's way further down the line. Yeah. And I think it's like they should be open enough and, and transparency, right? Be transparent enough. to acknowledge. And I think owners yeah. need to be a bit more open in their relationship. Get to know that person. Yeah. You know, just simple things like I don't do it often and I haven't done it often enough, but yeah. just, you know, go and sit with them, you know, in, in your staff canteen or go and grab a chai in the winter on the on the road with them or, or a little casual lunch with them it doesn't matter yeah. it doesn't have to be fun go and eat what food they relate to it doesn't matter yeah. you're, you're kind of getting to know somebody yeah um yes there's some cultures who are a bit sort of reserved reserved and they don't yeah. want you interfering in that yeah and that's fine um but that doesn't mean they don't believe in what you're doing or what you're saying and i think yes it's rare yeah. But I don't think it's only just a problem here. I think I, I see it in Kenya as well. Like yeah. Fika, the, there's, I got the most, Fika's what, just about two years old coming up to mm -hmm. uh, in June this year as an, as an up and running business. Yeah, um, We had a, an engineer join us just a few months after that. So he's been with us like consistently, puts in the hours. And somebody joined us in end of March last year. And on the day, it was a one year anniversary. She sent one of the most beautiful messages to me. And yeah. I did get a little emotional. I looked at this and I said, wow, I've got people who have sat with me for 12 years. And they say, ah, oh, sir, it's great. You know, I've been here 12 years. Thank yeah. you very much. And, you know, you'll do yeah. a lunch for them and give them a little memento or a gift or something. Yeah. And I was so touched with what she wrote to me. And I thought, you know what? I didn't remember. And I felt bad because I didn't remember she's been with you in, in me in a year because the year has gone so fast. Yeah. And she's talking about what she's learned from me or and collectively as a small team. Yeah. Whereas I didn't remember and I didn't, and obviously now the response to her was to say how well she's done, how well she's growing, which she is. Yeah. And I think that recognition 
and not false recognition just for the sake of it. Be yeah. genuine about your relationship with your employees. Yeah, I remember that about my my first boss. She's such an inspiration. I still talk to her today. I got first job at a university, sales job, cold calling, 40 cold calls a day. Really fun, high testosterone. We were in like a, a Wall Street type of floor in Toronto. So we're banging the phones and we're trading FX derivatives. So pretty good energy. And then I had this lady who took a chance on me. Uh, I did about nine interviews to get that job. She wanted me to meet everyone. She's She couldn't believe her luck. She's like, look what I found. <laughs> you got to talk to this guy. I, I don't know how I dress. I was the youngest hire ever and she's taking a chance on me. And she wasn't like a crazy FX trader herself. She was a branch manager. So she'd look after the traders and the salespeople and the operation people, but she's more of a, a connector, right? She didn't know. People person. She's a people person. She had no idea what the markets were doing. She didn't care for it. But the way she made me feel comfortable as the most inexperienced, the youngest guy in his first ever job to do such a hard job, uh, lessons that I've never been able to let go. And um, even if it's learning about my culture in our off hours, just to be able to talk to me about it in our one-on-ones or just noticing from the corner of our eye if I'm in an up mood or a down mood that day and then taking me out and then talking to me about it. Or even there was a, there's a there's a bit of a time where I was getting ragged on and bullied in in that situation because you know it's a very high energy slash racist slash fun but like at the start I just didn't know what it's gonna be like and I went up to her and she almost cried like I could see tears in her eye when I was telling her I was in pain so like that was the level of empathy she had and I wanted to replicate because she that. probably felt that. Well, she took it as a she responsibility, as well, right? Like yeah, not fail, yeah. but it, like you said, it was her responsibility. Yeah. So she took that in, and then seven years later, I became a manager of a trading floor, uh, and I looked after people, and I just realized how hard that is, especially when the people you want to put in the effort for uh, may not be your A players too, right? So like there is a time I she um, I sat with her for coffee. This is after I'm a manager, and she's no longer my boss. And she asked me this one question. She's like, you have two people. One is a great performer. The other is a poor performer. Who would you spend more time improving? And I said, well, the poor performer, because like we need to bring them up because the good ones got to go. She's like, no, you, you drop the poor performer and you spent all your energy on the good performer. And lessons like that, I'm like, how did you learn all of this? Is that true though? Is, is that what you would do too? If you had a poor performer, a great performer, and you had to spend energy to either improve so the you, poor. So you learn from that mistake, right? Or yeah. I've learned from that mistake. You hire yeah. people and you look at your A performer yeah. and then whatever, he's in sales or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And usually they're in sales because you're talking performance is usually linked to some sort of sales or growth perspective, right? Yeah. And, or just generally in work ethic, they're a great performer. Yeah. And then you've got the B or stroke C, I mean, C really shouldn't be in your company, right? Yeah. But B performance there and you start focusing on energy, your mm -hmm. energy there. And then you realize you should really realize at a cutoff point that, you know, you're wasting time. Yeah. And I've learned that a couple of times and I learned, we learned it the hard way as well. Yeah. Um, I remember we employed somebody she seemed like a good fit, was doing the right things. And then there was this dip, major dip. And I remember being with a fellow EO member actually mm -hmm. in Hyderabad at a gl global EO event. We were going to some dinner that evening and we were packed in this bus. And I don't know if you've ever been to Hyderabad, but if you go yeah. through the old town uh, at like six, seven in the evening, it is, the traffic is like one kilometer will take you an hour. Yeah. And we're all jam packed in this bus and I was sitting next to him and he goes, how's this going? And he said, you hired this new operations person like a few months ago, or six months ago. And I said, you know, the first three months were great. And he said, and? <laughs> he said, the, next, the last two, three months have not been great. And he said, what's mm. the issue? And I said, this. He said, you need to cut her. You need to let her go. He said, how much time are you investing in this? I said, every other day, an hour a day. He said, dude, mm. this is like ridiculous. You cannot be investing that time. Yeah. And lo and behold, you know, we got, I still didn't listen for another three months because suddenly, miraculously, I come back yeah. and the performance goes up and then it started going down again. And at that point, I had the conversation. Uh, unfortunately, it turned nasty, but yeah. that's a different you know, discussion. Yeah. But I think he was obviously speaking from his own experience where he's learned yeah. those messages. You know, like don't fo focus on you know, always 
if you see, but I don't wholly agree with them. So, okay, but being devil's yeah. advocate, sure. there are times that they're a B plus performer, yeah. or they're just. And again, I, I go back to the whole thing of knowing your employee. It's like knowing your customer. Mm -hmm. I grew up with this notion in life that even in your companies or our companies, mm -hmm. we are also one another's customers, if you think about it that way. Sure. You're right. You should speak to each other with respect. You should um, persuade each other, persuade each other encourage yeah. each other. Um, you know, you've got to support each other as if yeah. you were one another's customers yeah. right and that respect has to be there right mm -hmm. or instilled in you could say the sort of this is our values of you know integrity and you know respect and so on and so forth and i think what happens is when you have these conversations with your b or b plus or b minus player or whatever you want to call them find out where are they in their life wait what position are they in what why is it you know, they might just be going through something. And again, I bring it back here. So I've had this situation recently in Fika. I saw a dip in performance with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's going on? Like, this is not you. And they're like, sir, can I talk to you? I'm like, sure, when? They're like, can we schedule it for, I think it was a Thursday. And I was in Kenya, obviously. And I said, sure. And I said, but aren't you in this other office of ours Tomorrow, she said, yeah, but I don't want to talk about it in the office. I said, who said we have to talk about it in the office? We went for a coffee at the coffee shop. And it was a very personal situation, dynamic this person was going through. Mm -hmm. We sat for two hours. Um, there were tears shed on the other side. And the person, I gave the person half day off. They came back recharged from the weekend. And they started to work on those problems within the family that they had, not using my advice. I guess EO helps you with this because we use experience share, but it works. Mm -hmm. And um, performance picked up. And again, I get a very nice message to say, sir, thank you very much. You know, you really cleared my head. I needed to talk to somebody. And sometimes when you are going through an issue, you can't talk to a friend because they kind of may know the friend of a friend or a business associate who you, you have the issue with or a family member, vice versa. Yeah. And sometimes just talking to a stranger can really let things off. I, I mean, I don't know if, if you've ever experienced this. I've had I, it once I truly or twice. Have. I truly have. I have some of my closest friends that I'd rather not talk about certain things because I already know their opinion about it. Which, not to say they're bad listeners, but because they're friends and they have this kind of power in the relationship, they can get to that solution much faster instead of just listening out, right? Versus going to CBT therapy, for example, when I did in Toronto. That was such a weird experience. You're going to go talk to a stranger about your problems. But I'd walk out of there every single time feeling light. And it's not like that person helped. They just let, they just prod it on. They just poked in the right places and get me. It's kind of like almost like if you had a mentor, if you wanted a mentor, this, this person that you really wish was your mentor, you have them in your mind, you got their email address, you start writing them the email. Hey, I'd love to get your opinion on X, Y, Z. By the t before you hit send, you already know the answer because mm. you took the time to write it out. And it's not even a stranger. It's just an email client that you opened up to write it. No, so I do, I do agree. Sometimes being able to talk to a stranger or... Talking personal within work boundaries. Have you ever sat boundaries? on a plane? Yeah. And turn around. You're on a six-hour flight or thirteen-hour flight, mm -hmm. and you just start gassing and talking to somebody. I've done that. And then you suddenly realize either you or they are talking about very personal things. Very personal yeah. thing. Yeah. And they walk away, and they might not give you a hug, but they're like, "Thank you so much," and yeah. then you'll be in touch, and then you become friends and whatever. Yeah. Right. Hundred percent. But that's the same thing, right? But you also yeah. build that. It's a strange end, and they're not there to judge you, right? They know nothing about the background. Exactly. But they look at things actually probably more objectively, objectively. than subjectively because your friends and family will probably know a lot or probably even 20, 30%, which is too much about a situation. And 100%. I think that's, again, going back to employees, you need to really spend that time with, like, you know, I have, I have a staff, a couple of staff members here, you know, he yeah. was constantly, oh, I need this time off. I need this time off. And I said, why? He said, I've got to go to the hospital. I've got to go to this. My wife needs to go to the hospital. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I sat down with him. I said, buddy, is everything all right with the wife? And he says, well, you know, we're going through this, this, this. Yeah. How do I, you know, um, so I need this time and this. And I said, look, I went through something similar, right? And he goes, oh, you did? So I'm being vulnerable, right? But I'm sharing with him. But I related to his problem, gave him the time off. And then he comes back stronger. And I think that's the difference here. We, yeah. And I'm not saying nobody does it, but I also think we often forget. Or we, do, we also, sometimes we genuinely don't have that time to have that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship yeah. with our staff. And I'm not saying you need to dig into everything. Just be remotely empathetic to them in a, in a soft way. And yeah. they will relate to you. And they will... And I think it's classic. Or in, make them in, feel comfortable in all too, our companies. You know? I mean, my father's late father's company mm -hmm. is not, you know, it's not, it's not. How, it's a business we've inherited, and even the businesses we've set up and I've set up. Yeah, my father was involved in terms of like, yeah, he's part of the business, but he never got involved in our businesses. Yeah, actually, he stayed well away from them. He would guide us and say, okay, you're in this problem. What do you guys want to do? And he would guide us and say, okay, you learned from the mistake? Okay, what did you learn? And you learned X. Okay, good, go. He was, <laughs> I'll be very honest, he was involved in helping us set it up. Yeah. But, and and I, I do really miss his guidance and that mentorship, um, especially when you hit, because he was very calm and collective. And, you know, when you're younger, you are a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more like flippant and you're like, no, I want to do it this way. And then you, yeah, go and do it that way. And then you'll realize that when you come back, you need to put your feet on the ice and cool down a bit. And then he'll tell you what, you know, say. so I'll say, why didn't you say this to me in the first place? He said, because I wanted you to learn from that. And I said, but did you learn from that? He said, yeah. But I said, you didn't have a business mentor. Your grandfather passed away years ago. Your, your father was a lawyer. He said, yeah, but he, was, he still had some level of business acumen. He's running a law firm. He was involved in a couple of businesses. And he said, as a lawyer, he would see businesses failing, right? So he would know why they failed. Mm. And he would have one or two people who he look up to, to go and talk to. The mm. same way I do today, apart from my father, mm -hmm. I have one or two people who I want to go and talk to. I go to Kenya, for example. Mm -hmm. There's a certain uncle. I love to go and sit with him for half an hour, an hour. And he'll just, I don't go and ask him any advice. I just have a conversation with him. Yeah, And I always get back in the car going, I learned something new today, Yeah, you know, because these guys were cut from a different cloth Yeah, and their grit, their determination was very different. I think we've had it very easy in life. Yeah. I think that generation has something yeah. to it. Like, totally. so I play, I play, I play footy three times a week and we, we still have these 55 year olds that play with us. And it's just something else about that. I don't know. It was the food. It was the uh, the time in nature. Or, you know, playing outside on the streets all day versus us. You know, you know, we kind of grew up around that edge of technology when it was coming into our homes. But yeah, that that's that's something else. The grit, that uh, the hustle. Like when we use the word hustle today, we don't know what it means. <laughs> the people that have done it. For example, my dad. He was uh, sixteen or seventeen. His father had passed away. He got on a random uh, oil tanker, not tanker, some kind of a tanker uh, in Karachi. He traveled from like Punjab, from Lahore to Karachi with his friends. Someone told him there's this place called Sharjah, which is up and coming. This is 1970. He's like, how do we get there? He's like, well, a few of us are going to hide in the engine room of this tanker. You want to come? And he said, yeah. Uh, the head got to Sharjah. Uh, they docked. They didn't get out because police dogs were uh, working yeah. around. They stayed in the engine room for six hours, got out, and like, oh, what do we do here? There's a mosque right there. They go into a mosque, and the imam kind of looks back after doing the prayer. He's like, I haven't seen your faces before. You guys want jobs? So that level of hustle, to be able to do that, to you know, provide for your family and make make meaning for yourself, so, is something that... And I think they're built <laughs> you know? from a different... Yeah. They're built with different mindset. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather was a barrister. He did very well. Yeah. Um, he, my, my father went to study in England, near Liverpool. And um, I'm a big Liverpool football fan. And, and it comes from, from dad, from my father. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching a couple of football games at home, big games. And, um, you know, in London in our apartment, my wife was there. And at one point, you know, we were 3-0 down or something, and then or 2-0 down or something in the FA Cup final. And we went 3-2, mm -hmm. was it 4-2? 
or three or something. Mm -hmm. And and as we were down and everything, you said, relax, we were Liverpool. And there's a reason I'm coming to the story. I remember when we started getting the goals back and getting even and then winning, I remember him jumping off the sofa and pumping his hands. And, you know, <laughs> my wife's looking at me, she's looking at dad, and I'm looking at him going, what are you doing? And he's like, we are Liverpool, we never walk alone. And then I said, Dan, you know, where did your love for Liverpool come? He said, obviously I studied there, but I had two choices. I could either go to Everton and support mm -hmm. Everton or I could support Liverpool, but Liverpool was my team. And I said, yeah. So did you go to a lot of matches? He said, yeah, I used to go to the terraces because they used to have terraces in those days. There were no seats, you used to stand on the terraces. He said, I used to stand on the Cop End Terrace. I'm like, wow, Cop End? Like, that's like, you know, it's like the Holy Grail at Liverpool, yeah. right? And it was a terrace. I said, but you know, so you used to get a lot of money from Bauji, Bauji being grandfather. He's like, no, what are you talking about? I'm like, so how did you pay for it? He said, I used to work in the coal carriages in the winter at night. I said, what were you doing in the coal carriages? You were like, what, clean? He said, I used to sweep them. And I looked at my father, I said, what? He said, I used to sweep the coal carriages, earn yeah. my money so I could go to football games and go to the dance halls with the girls and do all that. Yeah, And that's where I realized, not just then, but many stories like this of who he really was, and where he, you know, we're coming back to this, but yeah, it, these are the things that instill you or are instilled in me. I mean, it sounds cliche, but my parents are the compass of my morality mm. and they very much guide me between what's, have always guided me between what's right and wrong, but their grit I think dad's ability to stay calm was in, he's seen very challenging times. Yeah. But he never, ever, ever let that be known to us. I got to know it in later years when I'd see those challenges because I was older, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's the same for me when I, when I sit now and I'm 36 now, dad's 71, and I start to hear stories now. I'm like, why did you ever tell us? Like, why are you so calm like the Buddha? Throughout my upbringing, like, how could I not have known that you've seen that side of the world? Mm. But I'm going to switch gears now, Rishi. I'm mm. going to talk about um, some practical business stuff. Because mm. this is, however, my the, the, my first business podcast. Sure. So, safe to say you're a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, I mean we, can, we can argue the term, but yeah. uh, you have a knack of starting businesses on your own now. Yeah. I, I wanted to see one particular thing. How... The way you choose your next business venture, what does that what does that look like? Where do you get your ideas from? Do the opportunities come to you? You can talk about it in relation to the ones that you've started or if there's any other that you're planning in the future. But is it similar to your dad in terms of like you were just there and you saw the opportunity or were was it research, studied, someone came to you? How do you how do you get your ideas to start your new business? So let me let me sort of clarify how this started. I, I was yeah. working in, in London. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I were working there. My brother graduated in London. We had a neighbor who did a very innovative thing. He sold PCB prototyping machines. So you prototype machines with um, CNC and laser etching. No more chemicals. So it's kind of like molding? Yeah, but it's just Injection like a drilling. And, yeah, okay. you, but more sort of drilling, etching. And now it's 3D MI technology okay. and it's even more advanced. And he was an agent for this German company. So my brother was... He's also very entrepreneurial, probably more entrepreneurial than me. He graduated. He decides to cut. My parents had moved to Dubai from the UK. Dad wanted to be a little closer to Kenya. Mum didn't really want to go back to Kenya. We were done with studies. I was married, you know, in London. And he came and he said, I want to bring this distribution, which he did. He did it with this. We did it with this sort of neighbor partner, but that fell apart very quickly, thankfully. <laughs> Um, and Good riddance. yeah, I mean, it just wasn't going to work out. Right. And we'd realized early on and he sort of started this. And then over that year, I was making trips back here for trade shows and coming back and trying to convince my wife we should move here. And we did, and we moved here and then I'll be very open with you. We, we grew that business. He was sales. I was more ops. And through that, we diversified into the car wash. So car wash, we were sitting there and he said, you know, there's so many cars here, Rish, and there's just a wastage of water. So how do we do this? And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, can we not clean cars without water? And we started Googling in those days and checking. So we this found- This was just a random thought on the couch, kind of just- 
Yeah, just like this. Shooting the breeze. Yeah, okay. Like, or it was in the office or something. Yeah. And we're sitting there and he goes, yeah, I think we need to do something like this. So he starts Googling, I start Googling, and then we find these products, we bring these products in, and we're like, well, none of them are going to work in the heat. And then we found this manufacturer where we said, look, in the UK that we've got, no, we found this supply in the UK, but it was really expensive by the time we brought it in. And we're like, this isn't cost effective. And we wanted to sell the product to car washing companies, but we realized they're not going to switch to this. Wait, not. Can I ask, you're talking about getting the product and the suppliers, but did you assess market demand in some way first or did you go straight to like, this is going to work? No, we knew it worked because everybody washes their car like three times a week here. So yeah. we're like, you go to malls and there was this big drum of water with dirty rag in it and they're yeah. just cleaning it. And my mother's like, man, people own like Ferraris here and Lamborghinis. And, and, yeah. and you know, in those days when we, when I moved here, we were like driving around in those diamond lease Nissans, you know, <laughs> you know those, you know, uh, whatever, Mitsubishis. Yeah. And, and, and it was cool. And I, and I miss those days at times because they were cool. And, you know, yeah. we, our office was in Bardubai near Burjuman. Mm -hmm. and, and you'd walk out and this guy would be there with a bucket cleaning your dirty Ferrari, cars. And I'm yeah. like, man, what is this? And he's like, yeah, look at this. So we bought this product and it was too expensive. Mm -hmm. And then I kept researching and I found this guy in the UK and I said, look, I've got this product. I got this product. This doesn't do this well on the car. It dries too quickly as a waterless agent. And this one doesn't give that sheen and polish. He said, do you mind sending them back to the UK for me? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I sent them back to him and then we flew out to meet this guy. And he literally put this chemical on this like little, it looked like a weighing machine sort of thing. Like a Petri dish almost. Yeah, yeah. but it was, it was more on a steel, like, yeah. you know, those weighing machines sort of things. Yeah, but yeah. it's basically um, sort of does the microbiology calculation of what the chemicals yeah. are. He said, okay, yeah. you've got this, you've got this. And he said, come back tomorrow. So he came back crazy tomorrow. scientist? This guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's just working out what works. So he knew, and he gave us two, three bottles, and we came back to Dubai, and then we went into the hard slog of testing in the heat and all mm -hmm. that. And then we secured contracts together, and that became my baby, because he's like, look, I'll look after laser electronics, which was the PCP side, and you look after Kausch. And this is where dad mm -hmm. actually stepped in and said, look, mm -hmm. I think you two should kind of not split, but take a division of roles of responsibilities mm -hmm. within the company. And I learned a lot of lessons in that one. And then while this thing was going on, we also started supplying machines to a company here on the laser side to somebody who was prototyping LED lighting, which was very new and very nascent in the world then. And this chap liked my brother's very aggressive sales side. So he started getting him contracts, my brother very big contracts, and lo and behold, he didn't get paid or we didn't get paid. And we went to a lawyer, and this was just around sort of 09. So there's a lot of these real estate legacy mm -hmm. cases going on and bankruptcy cases yeah. going on. And very, was my, I still remember this meeting very, very well. It was my, my brother, myself, my father, and this very elderly Emirati lawyer. Um, and he was wearing a, a sort of dark brown kandura. And I'll never forget this gentleman. Mm -hmm. And he sat there and he said, you boys have been taught LED lighting. Well, more your brother, but you know it as well. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. And you sold him machines and he kind of paid you, but didn't pay you. And he owes you guys substantial more money. I know especially your brother, because he was doing this side sales for him. Because So you've been done. I'm like, yeah. He's like, just leave it. We're like, what? what do you mean leave it? He's like, yeah, well, like, what is this? Like, you want to go to court? And we're like, well, yeah. And my father, this is where he would say, he would do this with his hand, saying, listen, calm down. Just listen to the old man. Like, mm. Probably similar age. Yeah, yeah. Do this. He said, please, sir, carry on. He said, look, he's taught you everything. And he gave sort of like a fable to us. He said, you know his supply chain. We're like, yeah, we do. But we're like, he, they won't supply to us. He's like, yeah, but have you tried hard enough? We're like, well, we've emailed them. He's like, well, and are you telling them you're from Dubai? We're like, yes. He's like, well, that's not going to work, is it? Because he's in Dubai. And are you telling them from the Middle East? He's like, yeah. He's like, but you just said you're from Kenya. And we're like, yes, we're from Kenya. He says, so maybe you need to say you're from Kenya and you're interested in this. Anyway, <laughs> he then tells us, he said, look, you know, he's taught you something. Let him be that he thinks he's got away free with it. 
Like, you ain't suing him. There's no money owed to you. you your brother, the companies, whatever. Just let it be. Just let him feel like he's won the battle. Yeah. He said, let me give you a story. I'm going to give you my Mercedes. It's 10 years old for free. Take it. I owe you 100,000 dirhams. It's worth 150. Tell us. You take it. And he said, but you'll probably take it, right? We're like, yeah, you're giving me 150,000 dirhams Mercedes. He said, but... It's the deal is do it now, 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 now. You sign now, take the car, debts owed, cancelled everything, you've taken the car. We said, all right, wonderful. So then what? He said, the story is this. You don't know the real condition of the car. And even if you did some checks on it, you will say, oh, I need to spend 10, 20,000. It's still I'm 150, becomes 130, and I was owed 100. I've done better. He said, the reality is you don't know the full extent of the vehicle. And you will end up spending a lot of money. So you want him to feel he got away, but he'll pay for it later. So he said, I want you guys to make him feel like you pay for it later. So we got back in the car, <laughs> drove back, sat down. <laughs> and my dad's like, I hope you two listen to so-and-so. We're like, yeah, but what, what's he on? Like, what is this? And my brother and I sat there. And then we went for lunch, three of us, which we used to do every day. And the dad's like 3.34, he's like, I'm going home. He's like, all right, see. So he's sitting there, he said, so my, my brother's sitting there and he goes, bro, man, like, there's something about, I said, yeah, I've been thinking about this, there's something about this. He's like, we know his supplier and we don't just operate as, as a family in the UAE or the Middle East. We've got so many channels. Mm -hmm. Flew out to Hong Kong, found the supplier, met him and Bob's your uncle. But more than that, that wasn't the key. The key was we found an even better supplier with a bigger brand. And that story was actually very interesting how we found it. There was a big billboard yeah. display of them. And I was researching which companies to go and look for in Hong Kong and China. And we went to the China side border. Nobody would give us time of day. We literally had very little money to go yeah. around and nobody would give us samples. And But I found this company here in, in Hong Kong, but I Googled them from here. But they wouldn't reply. And every time they'd reply, it would come in like some encrypted code. To the email. Yeah, it was like, yeah. I'd write, hey, Naeem, how are you doing? Or hi, you know, I'm interested. We're flying into Hong Kong. We'd love mm -hmm. to come and meet you guys. And they would reply back some nonsense. Like it was all coded and there was part of it was in Mandarin and part of it was in English. And I was, mm -hmm. I would print it to see if I could like make, because it's the third time I'd try and print it and say, yeah. how does this line up the dots? Is this on like Morse code or something? Yeah. You know, like, what am I doing? Are they in trouble? <laughs> they need, like, and I'm thinking, call the police? they're part of like one of these massive group in Hong Kong. Yeah. So we're driving out of somewhere in Kowloon and there's this massive billboard of this company. And there's a guy holding an LED light bulb. Yeah. And jeans and his torso is a full six pack like one of those amazing abercrombie ads okay. it looked exactly like an abercrombie ad but he's yeah, holding yeah. a light and what's the light doing lighting up his torso yeah i'm like bro that's the company he's like that's the company i'm like yeah he said give me give me give me the name again this he went on send the email woke up in the morning monday morning there's an email please come and see us in our offices at two o'clock what i'm like man how did that work for you he said i don't know man it's good teamwork let's just go so we went Spoke to them, we got some samples, we came back and we just ripped through the entire yeah. hotel industry who was looking to retrofit mm -hmm. LED lighting. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. And then the car wash was also growing beautifully at that time. We had multiple locations, yeah. malls, residential towers, commercial buildings. We had private contracts, cleaning fleet cars. So yeah. it grew fantastically. Um, so yeah, that's a quick summary of those three. You want you want to tell us about Fika? Too? Oh, tell me, Fika was. Tell me, tell us, uh, tell the audience so, a little so about what Fika is. I'll tell you what Fika is, but or I'll what uh, Boda Bodas? Am I saying that right? Yeah, Boda yeah. Boda, I'll tips. tell you why they're called Boda Bodas, but I'll yeah. tell you how Fika came about. Yeah. We're on a family holiday. We're on a cruise ship, and we're in the Med, and I'm lying there on a sunbed looking out to the sea, and who's to my left? My brother. And he's looking at me and he turns around and he goes, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, what's up? He's like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, why? He said, I know you've had a couple of drinks, but you seem to be mumbling something to yourself. Have you, have you got a headphone on or something? I'm like, no, why? He's like, you seem like you're talking to yourself. I'm like, why? what's the issue, man? And he's like, well, what are you thinking? I said, man, I'm bored. He said, well, you're bored in, in life or you're bored on the cruise ship? 
I'm like, well, kind of a bit both, man. You see, you're bored here as well? I'm like, yeah, it's nice, but, you know, anyways, chill. We need to chill. What's mm. up? He said, what are you thinking? Is there something in your head? I know it. I said, man, there's a lot of talk about EVs, electric vehicles. He said, yes. He said, I said, don't you think we can do this for Bora Bodas and three-wheelers, tuk-tuks in Kenya? He said, yeah, why don't you go and research it, man? Why don't we do it? Anyway, so a Bora Bora is a motorbike, usually from an Indian OEM, but it can be Chinese, of course, or any OEM. Mm -hmm. And they're very big, big seats, very robust, 125 to 150 cc, some 100 cc. And they got the name Bora Bora from pretty much our side of Kenya, where, where the family's from, which is Kisumu, going to the Uganda side. They, they don't say border to border. They kind of drop the R sometimes. <laughs> so they go Bora Bora. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going border to border. Mm. Right? But it was actually Bora Bora. So <laughs> we used to have a Bora Bora guy in the office. It was mm. private, gig economy sort of guy. Mm -hmm. in Kenya and he would sometimes take me and my brother but more importantly he would like move our samples really quickly through the traffic like you know I need to get this light to that in yeah. the town or I need to pick up that document so use a border he's a courier basically yeah and they do it really efficiently so one day he comes to me and my brother or, or me and he goes I want to buy a motorbike I'm like yeah sure tell me and he goes I need 150 dollars like looking at him like you're buying a motorbike for 150 dollars He's like, yes, sir. And I'm like, what sort of crap is that? Like, what yeah. shitty bike are you, excuse my language, but what yeah, shitty yeah. bike are you buying for 150 yeah. bucks? He said, no, 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 sir. The bike is $1,000. You put 150 down and you microfinance and we pay $25 a week for 18 to 24 months, mm. depending on our plan. I said, okay. He said, so will you give me the money? I said, Patrick, wait. So I came back the next day and he came and said, so have you decided? I said, yeah, I'm good to give you the money, but I want to understand how does this work? So I'm an entrepreneur. I want to know, like, how, how's he going to like... This is after the cruise ship incident or before? Uh, after. Okay. I don't know. It's kind of like things happened, right? Yeah, it yeah. aligned forward or you could say there was some manifestation, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there with him and I'm like, how does this work? So he says, I buy the bike for this and put this deposit and I pay this much. I said, so how much is fuel in it? He said, depending on kilometers, but this is the average. And then I said, obviously, there's maintenance, you know, carburetor, oil, mm -hmm. brakes in the month. He said, yeah, this. And I said, how much do you earn? He said, ah, I can't tell you that. I said, dude, I just, I'm not interfering in your business. Just, I'm just trying to understand how this works. I'm thinking of something on borders. And he goes, what do you think? I said, first, give me this. I asked first. So he sat down. He gave me the numbers. I said, okay, you're making money, but really you're just churning cash over. So you are making he's playing money. a volume game, yeah. Rather but than a profit but game, but yeah. but he's he's rotating money basically. Right. He's making money, yeah. But not he could make a lot more. So I said, "What do you think of electric bikes?" He says, "Nah, yes, uh, it's not going to work." Mm -hmm. Why is it not going to work? Where will we charge? <laughs> where are we going to charge the bike? Sorry, I'm doing Kenya. I, I like love it. Doing yeah, sales. please where do we continue. Go, where are we going to charge? <laughs> I'm like, we'll figure that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, electric is dangerous. It can kill us. It can blow up. We'll die. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I said, right. what, what WhatsApp forwards have you been getting? By? So I'm like, dude, <laughs> yeah. here's $150. I literally gave him $150 worth of yeah. shillings and said, here's yeah. I'm going to do your thing. Yeah. And he said, I'll pay you back sooner. And he did in a month or less. No, it was about a month and a bit. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I then went off on this Googling tour of in, in, on, on the computer and traveling China and traveling India and checking various things. And I, I was very close to taking on a container of 20 foot and 20, 40 foot. And then it dawned on me. Patrick said, where are we going to charge? I'm like, yeah, I could bring this bikes in, but where the hell am I going to charge this? Anyway, the research showed we needed to build motorbikes with a battery swapping technology. So what Fika is in a nutshell. So Fika in Swahili means to arrive or have arrived. So Fika is basically, we are trying to build a more sustainable, affordable um, electric motorbike, but a transport system for Bora Boras, or you could say e or motor users in, motorbike users in East Africa and wider Africa. Yeah. So our focus isn't just Kenya or East Africa, it's right across Africa. Yeah. And we intend to do that and have been doing it through an electric motorbike with a battery swappable, swappable technology, which is IoT driven, 
in the battery with a full BMS system. So we know where the battery is, we know where the, I, the IoT gives us all the GPS coordinates, and we can see the battery health and conditions as well, where it's been swapped, how many times it's been swapped, the health and state of the battery, so on and so forth. Um, and that's basically what Fika is. Yeah. We built two POCs, they landed in March 2020, which is probably the most ideal time they could not have landed in Kenya because of COVID. Yeah. But we did some aggressive testing. We enhanced the bike from a hub motor to a mid motor. We bought 24 units in. We chose low hanging fruit to go into um, activation, which is B2B. Mm. So Rewind. Courier, courier companies and stuff like that? Yeah, or? Korea, small SMEs yeah. who have three bikes, five bikes, 10 bikes, or third okay. party logistics companies, TPLs, as they're uh -huh. commonly called here as well. Mm hmm. Rewind a little bit, Jan, end of Jan, February, end of Jan 2020, February 2020, I did a course in MIT um, by a fantastic professor called Bill Ole. We actually brought him into the EO chapter here last year. Um, he did what is called his, well, one of his flagship courses is called um, Disciplined Entrepreneurship. Hmm. Or the Entrepreneurship, Disciplined Entrepreneurship is the name of the book, actually, but Entrepreneurship development program, EDP, is the name of the course. Mm -hmm. And he basically teaches you how to build an IDE, not an SME, and, you know, the hockey stick approach. And and I learned so much through that course. And what I really learned was know your customer. Do you have a paying customer? Build the persona out of your customer. Mm -hmm. So I had Patrick, right? So I started building out that persona of what a Patrick is and what a Julius is and what a, you know, Onyango is or whatever he is or... And sorry, I'm saying he, but that's the predominant level of the persona there, sure. of a butter rider. Mm -hmm. And then do you have a paying customer is when you know you've got a business model to go mm -hmm. forward to. And then who's your decision-making unit? Who's your decision-making person? They could be multiple or just one person. And how are you going to scale this? And how to do A-B testing? Mm -hmm. Because we did all that. We actually built a mock business mm -hmm. of doing that in our six, seven day course. Mm. And it was phenomenal. And and it also helped me during COVID when the car wash business shut down and I had to pivot to disinfection and sanitization. Somebody said, why don't you look into this? And I said, yeah, but how would I get customers? So I started sticking out, got a quick flyer made and started sticking out ads on Facebook and Instagram. And yeah. I didn't really get much traction. I got a few from Facebook. And then I very quickly realized those are eyeballing places, not so much Facebook, but definitely Instagram. Instagrams is about PR and eyeballing. That's what yeah. it is, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you and I will finish today and I'll take a great picture of, yeah. you know, us two handsome men mm -hmm. and I'll Instagram it and it's great PR for me, right? Sure. And and maybe for you. Yeah. No, probably more for you. Well, this is the whole game. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then I realized I'm going to get onto Google Ads because part mm -hmm. of the thing was how do you target your customers? How do you get your product? And how do you A-B test that? You can A-B test anything through Google, right? These of days. course. And that's what I did. I put up a little, I put up a quick website using, yeah. I don't know, one of these godaddy.com things. Yeah, just a landing page. L -l 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 landing page, yeah. phone number, put some pictures up there. Got someone yeah. in the office to help me from the lighting design team. We put this thing, it looked yeah. okay. And and and, and got, a, through a friend, got a really nice connect um, on, on a Google sort of analytics guy. Yeah. Uh, a wonderful like a specialist. Uh, Russian guy, yeah. Daniel, okay. uh, who I've actually referred to several EOs and love him. Yeah. And he's really super efficient because he's he's analytical. And yeah. that's what Google Ads is about. It's yeah. about an analytics at the end of the day, an understanding. And he said, well, you need to spend so many thousands on this. I'm like, man, I don't have that sort of money. I'm like literally at zero revenue for the last three weeks. Yeah, And we got off onto that foot. And those are the learnings from... Small learnings, they're not the big scale learnings, but they're the foot learnings of how you can, having to, you know, venture into something new. And I applied that here, right? Well, not necessarily mm -hmm. something new, but a new vertical, but that wasn't the course, but I applied that here. And I suddenly, I remember the guy in the office, Praj, ringing me up on a Monday. He's like, he was working from home, right? And he goes, so have we got the disinfection approval? I'm like, yeah, it's come through, which a friend of mine helped me get very quickly and very appreciative mm -hmm. to him. And um, guess what happens? The phone starts ringing. The email comes through. And I think in the first week, we did like 50 jobs. Wow. And I'm like, and Prajal's first question to me, Prajal's like, so which team will we use? 
I said the car washes, because there's no car washing. How hard is it to disinfect? <laughs> they're not going to hire new people. And he's like, what do you mean? They're not trained. I said, we train them. He said, but how? I said, get in this other disinfection company to train us and say it's for our own thing. Yeah. And that's what we did. We used a competitor to come in huh. and train us. And then obviously we showed them loads and loads of reels off the internet of how they do it in the US and everything. Yeah. And I realized that's what kept the lights on in the business for the car wash. Yeah. And then we and obviously thankfully we are in Dubai, we're in the UAE. They were great with COVID. We were back on our feet opening up in June. Their next six months were struggles. But yeah. then with cost cutting and everything, we became more effective in our operations. But going back to Fika, yeah. Uh so Fika, we went down this B2B, which was you could say Were up. you always B2B focused or did you start thinking? No, B2C, B2C is the main focus, which is your Boda owner, yeah. your Boda rider. But the low the hanging individual fruit, itself. Yeah, the individual. Yeah. Right, but the B two B was the easier low hanging fruit, and yeah. that's where we could go. Um, and I learned, I guess, through the years of being an entrepreneur, but just in life, but setting up small businesses. And I think I said it to you earlier: start small, mm-hmm. perfect your offering. If we can, if you can perfect your offering, right, your product, whatever it is, whatever your offering is, service, whatever, get it perfect. And knowing you have a paying customer, then the scalability and the aggressive scale will come. Mm-hmm. But, you know, start small and, and be smart about what you do. How do you reconcile that with speed? Because we're talking about getting new ideas and being a serial entrepreneur. I imagine myself to be a serial entrepreneur at some point in my life. I'm just visioning. That it's on my vision board. I got this holding company. I got this agency for marketing. I got this podcast going and A, B and C. I've got a studio, et cetera, et cetera. I want to be able to turn myself into a guy that can reconcile quick decision making. So not overthinking and not over calculating and not, you know, tripping on my own thoughts and never getting any fun versus that per- perfectionism, which we talked about before recording, uh, protecting the reputation as well, not going to market with something crappy, but also not missing out on the opportunity and the speed of movement. So what's what's the balance like for you between those two things? I've learned in very, various experiences in life, it doesn't have to be with business. Mm-hmm. If you rush things too quickly and you haven't got them all the loose ends tied up, then you are bound to fail. Yeah, you learn from that and that's what we've learned, right? Yeah. Uh, that's what I've learned or we learn that, you know, you learn from your mistakes and you take them forward and, and correct them. I think you need to find that balance, you know. Um, I'll give you a classic example. Fika, 24 bikes were great. Mm-hmm. Great, 500,000 kilometers, already on the, on the, on the, on the, on the odometers, 5,000 battery swaps, doing great stuff. And then the next set of kits came in and I had this slight downtime in Kenya last year in July, August. And I'm like, right, gonna gonna hit the ground running. Now borders now. Also gonna carry on with leasing. And then I don't know. I started speaking to some of the team, Josh in engineering, and a couple of clients. And like, so you got the new bikes? I'm like, yeah. So you got a picture of them? I said, yeah, we've assembled two. Do you want to see them? He says, yeah, but. I thought you were going to make the seat a little longer and, 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 you know, a little bit more, you know, robustness here and there. And I had that once, I had it twice. And then Josh is saying the same thing to me. He said, sir, we've brought them in now. How do we do this? I said, there's ways. We'll work it out, but we don't want to damage the home migration and stuff. So we, so we went through that. And I went to the drawing board and two very, very good, good friends of mine well, I wouldn't say they were friends at the time. They were people I was introduced to, two brothers, incidentally, who, who have become very close to me in this process and have supported me endlessly in making some changes to the bike. Simple things. Longer, bigger, thicker seat, better carrier, better foot carrier, more, more uh, advanced foot carrier in the rear so they can carry goods if they're not carrying a passenger. Mm. It's just a sturdier bike. Yeah. yeah. And they've just been so, so instrumental in helping me. And that delayed us from August because you build and you test and you build. And you're not building the whole bike or the chassis. You're not touching the chassis. You're just adding some extensions to the seats and stuff. Yeah. And there's ways of bolting it on without damaging 
you know, take touching on the homologation of the actual bike. And we only got to a finished product by sort of November, December, after all the testing. And now we're selling. So the old me could have said, oh, it's nearly done. Let's just get it on the road. Mm -hmm. Or it's, forget it. We don't need to worry about the longer seat and all that. Let's just get it on the road. Yeah. And that would have been that speed element that go to market is more important. Then yeah. what happens? You fail. Word gets round. Yeah. Every time you launch any business, literally, yeah, unless it's super unique, you are operating in a village. That's how I look at things. You're operating in a village and yeah. word, the, the, you know, that bad news goes around quickly. Yeah, rep reputation. Reputation damage. is just I I, hey. I can't. It, it was it's not something I can have it. There's a name. It's not just a brand name. There's yeah. also my pride and my family name. Of course. And I'm not going to have that reputation on me, especially in in something where I'm trying to improve the lives of people at the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to do that. Yeah. And now and 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 what gives me comfort is. Now we've got com we've got plenty of competitors and they've raised tons and tons of money, but our bike is being compared toe to toe mm. with one or two of them right up there, and we're beating them now in sales or getting the activations there. Yeah, and that gives me the comfort that be patient. And what did I say earlier? Start small, perfect your product. Yeah, it's a, it's the almost the antithesis and antithesis. If I get that word right. Of Silicon Valley, where they're the move fast, break, move fast, break things kind of philosophy, which to me sounded like horse crap, but it was being spread through every major company. Mm -hmm. uh, and they started using different words like First launch, move. iterate, launch, iterate, iterate, iterate. And behind, hidden behind what the word iterate was actually launch incomplete and figure it out as you go. And maybe the damage is less when it's a, it's an online tool or something like that. But these products like you're talking about, people are using. But you're dealing with people's safety. Yeah, you're, you're, right. like it's quite dangerous. So you um, wake up in the middle of the night and you remember yeah. Patrick from two and a half years ago, sir, yeah. I don't want the bike to blow me up. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. on my conscience. Of course. Right? There's a there's a hu fellow human being on a bike Yeah. carrying a, carrying a lady with a, her son going to school. Yeah. I can't take that on my head. I have... Cannot, I could not ever, ever live with myself if something. So I'd rather take my time in getting it perfect. Yeah. And that's, I think, where we're at now. Even as of this morning, there's been a very small change Yeah. on the bike, which is not delayed us. It's just going to enhance things better for what we need to do in the future. Yeah. And, you know, I got a call from somebody on Monday saying, yeah, we'll take those five bikes, put them in the showroom. We've got customers coming this afternoon. I'm like, no, I want to just make this small change. You'll get them on Friday or Saturday. It's like, but we lose the sale. I said, no, you won't. You'll just tell them to come back on Friday yeah. or Saturday or next Monday and they will buy the bikes. Yeah. And guess what? They will. Because now they, they will come and they'll say, I don't like where the way this thing sits on the bike. It's a very small piece on the bike. Yeah. But it's an irritant, right? Which irritates me. And I said, what's the way around this? It's like, this, this, this. And yeah. they've worked on it, the team, and it's changed. And that, Especially if it's fixable or workable. It is fixable. You know, and it is an objection to a customer then, is, and you can is. work on it, so then right. do it. I had, um, for example, like a, a year ago, I had someone reach out to me at the same time that I was thinking of offering consulting services. So we've launched and built our agency and there's another lady that wanted to do the same and wanted to hire me to like help her guide through the zero to one phase. Um, and at that time, just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I didn't have like what my scope of work would be, what I would teach, how long it would take, how much it would cost. Um, and Alina and I sat down. She's I told you before we started. She's the speedy one. She's she's a rabbit. So she's like just put something together and just send it through and then try it out. And I kept thinking, and I couldn't articulate it at the time, but it was more of a reputational thing. If this is going to be my first, I want it to be something that I can use as a case study. Um, and also not damage me so that it could be my first and my last if I do it really quick. And uh, lo and behold, I waited a few months enough to realize that that's not something I want to do either. So that's the other thing of taking your time. Sometimes you get through 20, 25% way through and you're like, hold on a second. This is not what I thought it was going to be. And I'm not overcommitted to something now or living a new life 
that we didn't want to do, you know? And I think that's being accepting mm -hmm. of does this fit with where you want to be in your life? But more importantly, also not being greedy. Yes. Right? Yeah. And or that's short term thinking too, right? Greed, yeah, exactly. Short term thinking. Right? Yeah. And and I think unfortunately, a lot of people so I used to have short term. Well, we've all had it, right? Mm -hmm. We've all and, and as an entrepreneur, you you all look for the short term thinking. Of course. Now when I did when we did FICA, there was a objective plan to short term B2B leasing. Mm knowingly that at this point in time we're going to end those leases and then we'll either sell the secondhand bikes or give them off to other sort of non-b2b operators of third party for leasing yeah and that'll keep that bit of the lights or sell the bikes on but our ultimate game was we only always knew this was about traction and how bill Ollett always told me get your paying customer in the door we got the paying customer, kept the lights on the road, gave you the kilometers, gave us the battery swaps, gave us the understanding to make things perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that bike wasn't perfect, but it was perfect for the utility use that it had, right? Or the productive use, so to yeah. speak. And today, we're just able to get better and better at what we do. I, now, I sound like devil's advocate. Do Will you always have a perfect product? No. Probably not. Because you're always iterating. You're always wanting to improve. Yeah. Why? Because... Your customer wants something better, yeah. you know, the market wants something better and, and you yeah. always have to listen to your customer, Yeah. right? Um, why have I also want to step away from B2B? We'll sell to B2Bs, yes, there's good income and revenue, mm -hmm. but they're not the bigger play. I find with B2B, it's a very bespoke scenario. Oh, I want this extra thing on the bike and I want that. And because you're a startup, you kind of feel like you need to bend over backwards and customers yes. right and you need to do it. And I had to have a very harsh call with somebody yesterday and say, listen, you're comparing my bike to an EV bike, which is not the market dominant leader in, in ice bikes or you know, mm. industrial combustion engine bikes. We've modeled our bike to be the, on the leading tool and we're there, but you're trying to give us back because you were using this bike, which... Many do, and we appreciate that, and we acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But surely I can't keep making these small, small trinket changes for you at an FOC basis. Yeah. Oh, I never asked for it for an FOC. And I said, well, your email exchange to me actually said, you're being a little, um, <laughs> what was the word he used? Um, Non-committal in how you're going to make the changes. I said, there was something very committal about me. You want these changes, this is the cost. And he's like, yes, but I found that non-committal. I'm like, okay, matter of interpretation, how do we move forward? He said, what will it cost? I said, this is going to come from this guy. This is his cost. Please go and buy it from him directly. Oh, you're being transparent. I said, there's nothing to hide. I'm not here to make $2, $5. Because if I get involved, I'm going to get involved in sourcing, buying, sampling, and all this for you. He's like, yeah, but I said, but that's what you want me to do. I'm not going to get distracted on this. You want this on the additional stuff on the bike? Go and get it done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to have harsh conversations, even with your customers. Yeah. But not in an aggressive way, in a more softer, explanatory version to let them understand the space you're in as a business, yeah. but understand the space and the need they have, but give them the solution. And I gave him the solution, right? There is this solution. It cost X. Go to him. Unfortunately, he went to X and it came out 15% higher. Yeah. And I said to my friend, I said, why are you charging him 15% higher? He said, oh, this is the stuff you needed. Dude, I was giving it to you at cost. I'm like, man, just give it to him at cost because now I'm getting calls and you're making 15%. Yeah. He's like, oh, man, you serious? I said, it's just four bikes for him. Please just do it. Yeah. But again, there's that relationship that you help your customer. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's the education. Now, without sounding to uh, mean but you got to educate your customer at some points about what you do as a business what you stand for and what the deal what, what the deal was what are your cause right what what the deal was like yeah. when when we started working together you know customer whether it's a service or a product this was a deal that we started working on yeah. you as a customer have the right to wish and want which is why competition exists because if i don't do what you want there may be someone else elsewhere. 
I want to switch to competition. How do you generally, in all your businesses, keep a tab on competition? I'll tell you why I ask, because currently with my agency, we're in a red ocean. Extremely red. The reddest of red oceans is marketing agencies. Everyone has one. Um, and it's when we started it, we looked at no one and we just did our own thing. And we continue to do that because it's just, it just freaks me out. There are a number of agencies that are out there, their capabilities, the years of experience and their marketing messages and all that. I just want to put my head down and just work. But how do you, how do you look at competition? Do you keep tabs on? Do you spy? Do you, uh, do you just are a Google warrior with that kind of thing? Do you attend events and exhibitions? How are you keeping on top of what's going on, what your competitors are doing in your different businesses? So I don't run the lighting business so much now for the last two, three years. I've been involved more with Fika and my brother runs it. But back in the mm -hmm. day, we'd always keep an eye out on what competitors are doing, you know, what new products are coming. But one of my strengths in the business was also to be innovative and always find new products and sourcing and going to trade shows and all that. So when you go to trade shows, you're obviously seeing Mm. your competitors or suppliers who are supplying to your competitors and then you're working out where they're getting their product from. I think it's important to keep a track on your competitors. But having said that, I think it's also very dangerous to copy your competitors. I think it's also very dangerous to follow your competitors. You don't actually know the reason why they're doing what they're doing. They might have a client or a niche that's driven them there and it's paying their bread and butter. Yeah. Or it's their bread and butter business. So you don't actually know the full story. So I always say stick to your strengths, stick to your core. That doesn't mean you have to do things cheaper because you're losing a, a tender or losing a bid or you're not getting a client. Stick to your core, but also always make sure you demonstrate you have a better product offering and explain that. But mm -hmm. competitors, I mean, it sounds very simple, but better product offering. But if you know your customer, you should be able to win your customer over, regardless of saying, I'm going to give it to you 10% cheaper, or I'm going to give yeah. you freebies. Yeah, sometimes as startups, we've had to do that, right? Uh, I've been very conscious in FICA not to do that, because I believe once given free, it becomes a habit, but also given free be also becomes it's like... a reputation thing you again, do, Exactly, right? yeah. that is this really a good quality product then? He's just giving yeah. it to me free. Yeah. Um, on the other side of this is yeah. I love competition. Why? So as a person, you talked about anti-fragility, which is actually mm -hmm. what Bill Orlett, his motto is in his course. Um, I'm giving him a lot of plugs actually. Yeah, and better uh, better give us share the commission on yeah. the first. <laughs> uh, he, he has this notion about anti fragility, uh, mm -hmm. which obviously is he's a big sort of believe of. Uh, is it Doctor Nassim Nassim Taleb Taleb's yeah. book? But for people who may not know anti fragility, how would you define or describe it? Thriving in chaos. I'd paint the picture of the Hydra when you cut off one arm and it grows back two. Or how do you... I've, I've had this with people too. Like the, the boss I told you about, the first boss that I ever had, uh, we got into a big row once, big fight, and I was young and energetic. We were able to come out of that fight closer and stronger together. And I felt like that's when I really learned the meaning of that word. It's like our relationship is anti-fragile between me and Bernadette. That's the kind of people we are. If, if, you, if it gets attacked, we get stronger, or like the Hydra. But anyways. But you're right, yeah. because it's also with sometimes, have you been in a situation you've got into a real, excuse my language, shit show with a client? Mm -hmm. But and you today, come back, yeah. three years down the line, they're your best client and you have the best working relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That also is similar, right? It yeah. is being anti-fragile. But I actually like why I also relate thriving in chaos is because you're anti-fragile. You're able to thrive in chaos. Mm -hmm. I hate it when there are these, and they happen. Everything is going smooth. Everything's going very silky. looks good. You know, targets are being met. You know, money's rolling in. Uh, everyone's comfortable because then this apathy seeps in. People are a bit become into a lull. 
I like it when we're on our toes all the time and pushing and pushing and busy and busy and busy. Um, like the last, for Fika especially, the last three and a half, four weeks has been immense. immense. I mean, you know with my schedule, even the last two to three months, just starting in a time. Just getting you here, Rishi. Yes. <laughs> just and, getting and, you here. And, and part of that is, you know, <laughs> like this, these last few weeks have just been so intense for me. Mm -hmm. but I am so pumped up, so energized. I've never felt greater um, in, in what we're doing. I, I, I had a, a call with my team on Saturday afternoon from here around 11, 12 o'clock. So it was early morning there for them, they're about an hour behind. And I, I, I did it from, from home and my daughter walks in. She's seven and three quarters, nearly eight. And she... She knocks on the door and she goes, what are you doing? I'm like, why? I'm on a call. She's like, why are you like so shouting energetic. like a priest? I'm like, excuse me? And I had got into this motion of being so motivational and like really trying. I'm like, guys, look, you really need to sort this out. We've got a massive week ahead. We've got, you know, the following six activations coming. You're rectifying this on the bike. This is the deadline. This is this. You know, you really need to feel the passion. And they're coming back to me going, so this is our company. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, and I'm, you know, I got it. And I actually felt very deflated when she said that. I thought, hang on, man. Like, was I making myself look like a tit? Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, like, did I sound like a fool there? Like, did I really sound like a preacher? You know? And come Tuesday night, last night, we're ahead of Target and everything we're doing. And I'm thinking, wow, it worked. You know, because I like it when we're busy. Yeah? Because my my juices in my head, they just are on oh, overdrive. The I'm the same. Like I, I hate yeah. just, I, I love it when it's busy. Like yeah. super, super busy. I've got a million things going on. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm promoting Remarkable today, but I I got a Remarkable yesterday. I went straight to the calendar tool. Yeah. And I started writing my calendar stuff for today in terms of things to do list. Um, and I wrote 32 things and that's just for today. Yeah. Yeah. No, when, when I have an empty to-do list, oh. I get nothing done. Yeah. When I have 50 things to do, yeah. I get 52 things done. Yeah. Or maybe more. I, I don't, I don't know what that is, but like I've, I've noticed that in football too. When my team is winning five, five nil, I don't feel like playing. Yeah. But when we're like a, a goal right? away or two goals away and we're down. Yeah. It's just so much more enjoyable. Every touch of the ball is so you, much more You go enjoyable. back to competitors. Yeah. I have very good relationship with some of my competitors. Mm -hmm. So especially in the EV space in Kenya, um, I go and have a beer and a meal with two or three of them at a time. Yeah. Uh, and it's great because, you know, we'll drink, we'll eat, we get to know about each other, we get to know about each other's kids, you know. Um, a competitor of mine, his father passed away recently. And I was on a call with him. He said, do you know how much this means to me? I said, I don't know because I'm your competitor. He said, yeah, but it means more to me that you actually rang me and passed on your condolences to me. And he says, there's something different about this, Rish. I said, I, said, I see friendship. I said, on the playing field, ask no quarter, none given. Mm -hmm. On the playing field, I repeat, ask no quarter, none given. He said, fair, fair, fair game, buddy. I said, but here... When we talk, when we meet, we meet at exhibitions, we meet at venture talks, VCs, yeah. investors, whatever you're doing. Yeah, again, ask no quarter, none given. But when we're sitting around in the afternoon, having lunch, having beers, we're friends. Yeah. And, you know, I think the cake is big enough. Absolutely. And we can all share it. Absolutely. Yeah, we all want all of it. Mm -hmm. But then again, greed is a very dangerous thing. Yeah. And then you become gluttonous and then you yeah, end it's up It's not a zero-sum game, right? Like doing any kind of venture is, if you have zero-sum thinking, which I used to, I used to, have, I'm trying to grow out of it, right? Um, I want my share. Only one person can win, me or you. And it's been, it's been a journey. I do want to switch topics. We've been uh, talking a bit about, so we recap, we've talked about your influences early on getting into business. We've, we've spent a bit of time talking about Fika any other businesses, we can be here for another three hours because I do have questions for three hours. But I want to jump into um, the effect or the impact EO or entrepreneurs 
organization has had on you? And specifically, let, let me ask it this way. What unfair advantage do you think you've gained personally because of EO? Because I've heard that it's a sexy thing to say, right? As a business, you got to have an unfair advantage in the market. And what do you think that has been for you with EO? So what have I gained as an unfair advantage mm-hmm. from EO? Yeah. I think it's more... the ability or, or 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 knowing that i i'm in a group of like-minded people uh, and especially my forum um where eight of us um that they're this amazing sounding board for me you know um but that if you look at the wider group of 130 members uh, and then of course accelerators like yourself which is what another 30 that we're all in this together. We're all entrepreneurs. We're all at different scales. But this ability to know that I can talk freely with confidence and confidentiality to my fellow peers and not be judged, but walk away with nine times out of 10, always a learning of some sort. So... If I'm playing paddle with the EO boys on a, and girls on a, and ladies on a Sunday and we're just having coffee and there's always some learning or a snippet that comes out of it. Um, being in forum and being able to share candidly in a safe space with pure confidentiality gives me that unfair advantage that I have these amazing people and I'm also there for them. You know, Because you have to give back. You have to give back. Mm-hmm. And um, to me, it's been a, uh, so far an amazing journey with them, with being part of the entrepreneurs organization in, in being a member, the, the value you get from peer-to-peer conversations, like I mentioned, peer-to-peer learnings, the yeah. access to certain learnings that you wouldn't ordinarily get. And let me, let me give you a real interesting one, which I actually thought about three months ago is, would I do, would I go to a talk and spend Two, three, four hundred, five hundred dollars to go and listen to a motivational speaker or do a course on KPIs and stuff. I think being part of the organization has driven me to have that better thirst for learning, whether it's for my business, my personal growth, my family, my community, whatever it is, you know. Um, we did a, a very simple thing, nothing to relate to the business. We did a little talk on cyberbullying for kids the other day. I've seen hundreds of these courses turn up on my mm-hmm. feeds. Cyberbullying, you know, speak to your kids. And even the school emails, you know, you'll read it and you'll act on it and you won't probably dig deeper. Yeah. But because I'm part of this organization, you understand that others have gone through it because they talk to you about it candidly, yeah. right? And because of that, you attend that course because you've seen somebody else's experience or heard about it. So it's not even just about business stuff. It's just being a wholesome community. You know, we are one phenomenal community hmm. of entrepreneurs. We're, we're a family. And, and yeah. I'm very, very fortunate that, and I think we all are as members of you, not just in the UAE, hmm. Yeah. But globally across the hundreds and hundreds of chapters we have across the globe. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh what about um let's uh let's dig into some of the businesses within this EO community. Which businesses? My, minus the founder. Doesn't have to be your favorite founder there. But what businesses do you find really interesting that like when you came across someone who has a certain kind of business, you're like, Wow, that's cool. I wish I would have done that. Are there any businesses that you admire? Uh, within your forum or just a larger EO community in general? Yeah, I mean, one is MC, uh, Mary Christine, yeah. who mm-hmm. does Fruitful Day. I think such an innovative uh, way of, uh, you know, um, the, the more sort of healthy, nutritional yeah. way and getting it into corporates and then getting it into direct-to-consumers and, and yeah. then the way she's expanded her business. Um, and, and having followed her journey through the EOA program, which... I was once on the on the board there and then seeing her grow. And we did this competition sort of thing where we trained accelerators 
um, on how to pitch their business because we were doing a Dragon's Den. Uh-huh. Shark mock- Tank. Yeah, we're doing a thing. Shark Tank Dragon's yeah. Den thing. And we actually did it. Um, and we got a trainer to come in and train. And I remember MC being part of this process. And two, three of them or four of them pitched. And we did it in this very cool venue, um, which used to be in TCOM called the Barbary. Um, mm-hmm. It had these sort of, like sort of a very sort of New York Lights loft. Smoke. You know, out, those yeah. low um, sort of Art Deco style yeah. chairs <laughs> yeah. uh, with the judges all sitting there and, and fellow entrepreneurs. And we had a VC who'd been invited in to come and sit and, and, and it was great. Yeah. And then seeing that business evolve, I think MCs was great. Another one in my forum is a guy called Faisal. Uh, he runs a very large software company in the world, but his passion is being outdoors. And he does these conversions of off-road vehicles. So he'll take a Ford Transit van and make mm-hmm. it into this beautiful, luxurious sort of sleepover van that you can probably drive away anywhere into the desert. A thing. And he takes these mm-hmm. Land Rovers and uh, this um, Mercedes military truck, right, that sleeps six people. And, yeah. and it's got a fully fledged kitchen, you know, showering facilities. Yeah. And oh, yeah, most of it's outdoors, but it all opens out into this big grand. And, and these are the things that fascinate I me. Mean, there's so many in you. Yeah. There's just so many. Um, I unique. bet that's, that's the most fun part, right? Like just coming across, like, wow. You but guys that are also doing that? pushes you. So I was part of EO yeah. when I went through this whole FICA thing, right? I was yeah. already engrossed, you know, two, three years into it, engrossed mm-hmm. into it. And, and it makes you think that, you know, would I have ordinarily thought I'm bored in the business that's done? Yeah. But they, your peers push and elevate you to the next level. I'm not yeah. saying you need to be better and all things. You need to be, you know, always innovative, always thinking. But, you know, are you really happy in your space? And I wasn't at the time. Yeah. You know, I was happy that we were doing well, but was I happy that, I was, was I enjoying what I do? No, I wasn't. I think the distinction is, are you happy or are you comfortable? Yeah. Because sometimes they're not the same. Yeah. And and that was the point, a reflection point. Yeah. Uh, a very famous entrepreneur from the UAE, we did a talk with him in EO, mm-hmm. was uh, Fadi Gandur um, from Aramex. And somebody asked him, he says, Fadi, when do you, did you know that you're going to, you know, exit Aramex or put it on the stock exchange and list it and everything? He said, there will come a point in your life and you should have this realization, which I did, that they had, I, that accepting point in life that you will at some point f- fall out of love with your business. You won't hate it. You just won't have that enjoyment that don't have, so, so not so much love, don't have that attachment. Learn mm. that you have to detach from it. Mm-hmm. And, and you do that. You have to be accepting about it, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and and well, I think, absolutely. and, and that, that's, you know, what, and, and there are many businesses in EO, I think, which yeah. are so unique. You know, we've got JD who does this aggregating trucking model of aggregating all these truck drivers together. I think that's really cool. What exactly is that? So he, I mean, I'd be wrong to be pushing his business, but yeah. JD is, um, bring, you know, he is like an aggregated model of getting all these truck drivers on these, you know, these, Patan star yeah, guys yeah. and getting them all on an aggregator platform, getting ah, into okay. logistics and okay. getting into the logistics and booking them and online. And I'd be wrong Just in selling his business here, yeah, yeah. but you know, I, I find JD a phenomenal. Every yeah. entrepreneur of ours is so unique yeah. and so different. I think you know when you first uh, hear about someone breaking the uh, the fastest mile ever ran, and then everyone starts breaking it. Or if you break the sound barrier once at Mach 3 and then everyone starts, just when you see these people and you see what's possible, it gives you that, you know what? It is possible. It's not a, the thing that I'm dreaming about is not impossible because look around me. But look at it on a global scale. Mm-hmm. You, you, and I've been fortunate to travel a lot with EO for different reasons on leadership and stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you land up in an event and the, the speaker is the founder of Trivago, but mm. he happens to be a fellow EOA. Mm. Right. That access to somebody doesn't come That's easily, awesome. right? Yeah. Um, you know, there's this very, uh, um, uh, you, you see these wines in these restaurants here, they're called De Luca wines. Hmm. The Italian sort of labeled wines, D-E and then Luca. 
Sure. Or maybe it's D, no, not DED, and then Luca, and quite colorful sort of logo and stuff. And, you know, I was on this leadership call last year on this particular thing I was doing on leadership on the regional level. And we had to chime into a global call once a month. And I'm talking to this entrepreneur. I'm like, Katie, what do you do? And she says, I do Deluca wines. I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> and then I look at this and she's a big, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, just being able, that's, that's you know, if telling people that if you can't get into you, start a podcast. Because I get, I get the same thing, right? Every week uh, I get to meet someone like you and I hear your stories and I hear the wisdom that you've carried forward through the people that you've been around as well. Um, and Alina and I sit and watch these episodes together and we take notes like nerds, like, hey, Remember when Rishi said this or remember when Roma said that? But make sure it works for you and your goals and your objectives. Yeah, we're, we we do challenge a lot of it. Um, there, there, there are people that come on that I just generally agree more with um, from a very principled standpoint. So like you, I haven't been able to challenge you because a lot of what you're saying is already what I'm thinking. And then I'll have someone on that is completely like, for example, Roma and I are very different. Um, she's a bit more... Let's move fast. Let's not waste time. Let's get stuff done. That's um, and higher energy than mine. Even my my talking pace is a bit slower. Hers is faster. So it, that kind of that kind of dialogue also the contrast also helps you discover who you truly are and yeah. what you need to do. So it's good to surround yourself with like that mix for me. Um, we are gonna wrap up very soon. Okay, um, as suggested by our lovely friend David. There, I do have one. I don't know if this is a weird question, but I'm stealing it from Tim Ferriss. Are you a Tim Ferriss fan? Do you know him? Care about him? Not really. I don't care about him, but I know of yeah. him. But yeah. He, um, let's, let me see if I ask this right. So if you had a giant billboard. Yeah. On Sheikh Zayed Road, let's yeah. say. The giantess of billboards. Yeah. What message would you put out there? To entrepreneurs? It, to anyone. Preferably be entrepreneurs, but it can't be buy my product. It can't be a sales message. What would you wish to be seen? These millions of cars driving by every day. Mm. And it can't be about a four-day work week. Look, there are many cliche ones, right? Follow your dreams, which is true. Um, you know, there, there, there are just so many, but I think I'll be repeating, but this one really resonates with me in the space I'm in today, which is similar to, I don't know how to articulate this on a billboard, but, you know, given it's a message to entrepreneurs, you know, maybe there'll be something saying message to entrepreneurs or it's like something, that, you know, from the entrepreneurs organization, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. But I would still reiterate to all entrepreneurs, um, you know, start small, mm. perfect your product. So start small perfect your offering, scale. And I think that in its simplicity, in how I look at things, very black and white, I don't usually mm -hmm. pick up the gray paintbrush, should really resonate to, I mean, you can do, like I said, the follow your dreams, you know, you know, it's not nine to five. I, you, yeah. It's not nine to five and, you know, the hustle is real and all that. But let's be, for me, yeah. that's, for me, it's the start small. Perfect like report and scale because if you write there, think big. Yeah, you'll all, we all think big, but you yeah. always have to start somewhere. Yeah. And you always have to get it right. Yeah. And if I were to add to your message, I'd write direction over speed. Oh, I, I really like that one today. Yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's a bunch of things I still want to talk to you about. We, sure. we will have to get you back for round two, I think. Oh. Um, we, I want to talk to you about overwhelm and if you ever lose focus, how you get back your focus. I want to talk about your best and worthwhile investments. I want to talk about how you measure, you know, success for yourself on a day to day or month to month basis. I want to talk about financial freedom. There's there's a bunch of stuff I still want to talk to you about. You need but to I, come back. I think I think we'll need to do a round two at some point and uh, get more stories and maybe maybe Fika's grown a little bit, so we'll have more Fika stories oh. to go to go with. I'd too, love but, to. But uh, I've enjoyed this. I've taken uh, I've taken a good amount of notes. Um, most of them, I felt um, I felt some peace talking to you because I don't feel stupid about thinking what I was thinking about certain things. 
Um, I will challenge my own thinking though when I go home and compare these notes with Alina. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and uh, start small and uh, get the get the right thing out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rishi. Cheers, buddy. Thanks. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.